Also, Professor Danny Kwa and Professor Ata Hussein. I will now hand over to Dr. Dun. Dr. Dun, please. Yeah. Hi. Uh, welcome back to uh, this uh, panel. We have a last-minute change. The, our ex LLC colleague, uh, Professor Xu Chenggang, couldn't make it. We wish him well. And uh, so quickly, we, we managed to have even better show for today. So you get one free now, right? So two distinguished uh, LSC professors uh, with their you know, world-renowned uh, uh, researchers and, and, uh, and also engagements. And uh, we have Professor Atta Hussein from Asia Research Center and also Professor Danny Kwa. Um, Danny has many, many titles. And let me see. Uh, which one you, you prefer. Uh, <laughs> it's professor of econ economics and also professor of international development. So um, before I hand it over to them, uh, let me just say the following. For economists, we have two major concerns uh, in this world. One is efficiency, the other one is equality. Right? China is getting more and more efficient but China is having a problem with uh, equality. So I will pass this to Arthur. So Arthur, you have 15 minutes, whatever you want to say. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And so I can do no more than introduce some major points and raise some questions. In case of inequality, first when we start talking about, uh, I'm thinking of China, uh, we have to think of there is not one aspect but different aspects of inequality. So in Chinese case, we would say inter-household or inter-individual inter, inter inequality. Or we can talk about rural and urban inequality or regional inequality. That is between the coastal regions and the interior region. And so in China, there are certain distinctions which hold quite important. So first, let me concentrate on regional uh, dimension. That is, China is divided into coastal provinces which have mu much higher per capita income and level of development than the interior region. So that always raises the question whether the economic reforms have increased or widened regional inequalities or narrowed it. As it turns out, the answer is not clear-cut. It very much depends on how you actually define the region and how you measure inequality. So a question we might come to in discussion. The second aspect is rural and urban inequality in China has been a constant feature of the Chinese society and economy. That is, rural-urban distinction has been the central part of the governance of population in China. But on the other hand, we should remember that rural and urban areas are not uniform in China. But one thing which is worth emphasizing, that if you compare urban China, say, compare Shanghai with Chengdu, I mean, Sichuan is a relatively poor province, and Shanghai is, in terms of income, the richest province or city. The difference is not really all that huge. But if you look at the countryside, you know, the area, countryside in East China and compared with mountainous counties in the western region, the difference is huge. So one thing we should bear in mind, that is when we talk about inequality between different larger entities, in, in intra-group inequality may be also very important and may be the main contributor to the inequality. The second question we would like to ask is we would be most, because being economists, we would be concentrating on the economic aspects of inequality, but there are also social aspects, like inequality of social status, uh, which goes together with urban and rural inequality, may also be an important consideration. The third issue we want to raise is kind of causes of inequality, what has actually given rise to inequality. And here the question always comes, whether the market-oriented reform <coughs> have increased inequality or what aspects of these reforms are responsible for increasing inequality. And here we always confronted with the important outstanding fact about China that China, leaving aside whatever has happened to inequality, 
China has, um, has seen a very major, the biggest reduction in poverty ever seen in world history. So in the fact of poverty reduction it still remains regardless of uh, whatever has happened to inequality. So the question arises whether the reducing the proportion of population in, in poverty, whether it's compatible or incompatible with policies to change inequality. And the third, fourth question we would like to raise is um, what are the implications and results of inequality? I take the first question about trade-off between efficiency and equality. I think in general that there is no clear answer. To, in, a, in, in a theoretical model you can say you have a trade-off between efficiency and inequality. But when you look at the empirical reality, the honest answer is there is no, there is no, it's too ambiguous to ask the question trade-off between economic inequality and efficiency. It's very easy to construct cases, for example, where a person is actually starving on very low wages, pay, paying people high wages, which might reduce inequality, also increases their efficiency. People who want to say that people should, efficient people should get paid more the inefficient people, they can obviously point to a lot of examples. So, but I would say that now the opinion in the profession has tended to shift. It does not, no longer takes the trade-off story that seriously. It might happen in certain contexts, but it actually is very conjectural. And on the other hand, there is much more emphasis on the implications of in economic inequality. So let me end with a simple observation that one of the main impact of inequality is that the poor are generally not very good at making use of economic opportunities offered to them. So if you take purely, purely as a thought experiment, uh, same economic opportunities open to different groups. The generally people at the, at the, at the bottom of, of the pile usually are not the ones who make use of these economic opportunities. So the one impact of inequality is to disqualify a certain section of population from making full use of opportunities which the economy offers. I think with this I, I finish and then turn to Danny. Thank you. Oh, uh, thanks so much, Arthur. Um, you certainly save us a lot of time. Uh, so uh, good for the round table later on uh, for the debate. So uh, Danny, it's yours. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Kent. Um, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to get to speak to this uh, forum. You know, we're poor substitutes for Shengang, who would of <laughs> course be telling you about the horrors of the institutions that currently exist in uh, in China and how that those are obstacles to China's continued growth. Instead, what we've got here for you is an offering about inequality, which also, I suppose, is a very large policy issue. There are three points I want to make in my presentation. Those three points are draw on things that are relatively factual. But before I get into those three points, I would like to tell a story whose truth or falsity I cannot attest to, but it's a, I hope it's a fun story anyway. China has shaken the world, but in academic economics, the thing that has shaken the world, our world, our own China, is Thomas Piketty. We live in a post-Piketty world. And when I've traveled to different parts of the world and people who have the, not the slightest interest in economics, they all know Thomas Piketty's name. Because mm. Piketty has made the whole world sit up and talk about inequality. Thomas Piketty is a publishing phenomenon. Many people think of him as the rock star of economics. Amazon here is my, here's the fact, here are the set of, here's the story that I cannot attest the validity of. Amazon, when it sells its books on Kindle, of course, knows a lot about what happens to those books. If you read a book on Kindle, 
it reports back to Amazon how quickly you are reading, what passengers you have outlined, what passengers the great number of readers find the most interesting. So I'm told by people who, I, who know, I think, that up until Thomas Piketty's book, the fastest selling book on Amazon was Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. People bought more copies of Thomas Piketty's 600-page book than ever bought that tiny, slim volume, A Brief History of Time. And you think about it, that's amazing in so many ways. Stephen Hawking is a hero to the world. Not only has he overcome huge personal obstacle, he's written a book that tries to distill the wisdom of 25 years, 100 years of physics into a small, readable volume. Thomas Piketty displaced that. Thomas Piketty holds the record for the fastest and greatest number of books sold on Amazon via Kindle. But he also holds a second record on Amazon. Because Amazon Kindles report back to Amazon how much of the book you've read, Amazon knew long before everybody else that when people started reading A Brief History of Time, they usually stopped at about page 45. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, well, hardly anybody, has read past page 45. So here is Thomas Piketty's second record on Amazon Kindle. Nobody has gotten past page 16, <laughs> 600 page book. It is not just the fastest selling book, it is also the book that most people, more people than ever, stopped reading faster than any other book. <laughs> Here's the paradox for us. This is the book that grapples with possibly the largest social and economic issue of our time. It's obviously fired people's imagination. People don't get past page 16 of trying to understand it. Why? Because inequality has a simple story to it. All you have to do is pick up a book with the title Inequality in it, and you know exactly what you're supposed to think. Inequality is a terrible thing. The top 1% in the world that have made up with 60% of the world's wealth, they're terrible people. The more you can report that inequality has risen in some part of the world, the more ammunition you have for hitting that part of the world. That's all that you figure out in the first 15 pages, and you don't need to go beyond that. This is an extremely dangerous intellectual world that we live in. Because if you don't understand more, at least up to page 45, Stephen Hawking's record, then we are in a very sorry state when we try and discuss the problems of inequality. Mm -hmm. That's the background I want us to take into our discussion of China's social and economic inequality. We need to get beyond the headlines. We need to get beyond the page 16 of China's story of income inequality. We need to get beyond just saying, look, this is so terrible. 30 years ago, when China began its liberalization, its Gini coefficient was 28%, the same level as that we find in socialist, democrat, Western Europe. Today, its Gini coefficient is 49% higher in the world than every other major economy except two, South Africa and Brazil. That's the headline. That's the headline that unless we are careful, we carry that as our main message. I hope we don't do that. I want us to get past page 16. What do we need to think about to try and get past page 16? Here are my three points for us to delve into. First, we need to ask ourselves, how much is inequality the horror that we think it is? How much is it such a terrible thing? And by the, when I say that, I'm not going to try and defend the horrors of the capitalist system to say that when the top 1% make, get 60%, it is a good thing. I mean that as scholars and as students, we need to be extremely careful the lessons that we draw from this. What are some of those lessons we would like to understand? 
Is inequality debilitating for society? Does it paralyze society so that society can no longer function well? Mm. Or is it the opposite? Does inequality energize different elements of society? Okay. Get past page 16. Don't stop there. Don't be one of those 50,000 people who bought that book and then never got past page 16. Mm. That's my first point. The second point is one that Arthur, my co-panelist, has already referred to. We need to not just be clear, brutally clear, about what we think it, the question it raises are. We also need to be brutally clear about the facts. The page 15 fact is that inequality rose in Gini coefficient from 28% social democrat level to 49% higher than in the worst of, um, of free market capitalism. What are the facts there? As Arthur has already mentioned, the same time that this happened, China began with 835 million people, almost 90% 90 of its population living on less than a dollar a day. Yes, you had low inequality, but you know why? That's because everybody was poor. Today, its Gini coefficient is 49%. While all of this was happening, six, over 600 million people were lifted from poverty. 10 times the population of the United Kingdom, one and a half times the population of the United States, the greatest poverty reduction program in all seven million years of human history. Something very profound was going on. We need to get past page 15. Arthur, I, I learned a lot of my facts about inequality from Arthur and his research. He's pointed out how when you look across comparable units within China, Actually, levels of inequality are not out of line with the rest of the world. Cities have certain levels of inequality, whether it's the city of London, city in New York, city in Rio de Janeiro, different cities we come from. Beijing has about that same level of Gini coefficient in inequality. Shanghai has about that same level of inequality. Inequality across comparable units is not a uniquely China phenomenon. It is the same everywhere else in the world. Arthur has just reported to you, if, even if you look across cities, Chengdu versus Shanghai, the difference in levels of income is not huge. Cities are much alike. That's not the source for the China rise in inequality. What is it instead then? It's the difference across rural and urban areas. It is how cities have raced so far ahead in development, bringing along with it, creating hundreds of billionaires, hundreds of dollar billionaires. When we began this history 30 years ago, with the Gini coefficient 28%, everyone egalitarian, China's average income was less than 2% that of the United States. Today, China has $596 billionaires, more than any other country, including the United States. The, the complexity of these changes it goes beyond what we get in the first 15 pages. So we need to start thinking hard. What are the sources of these inequalities? What is the mechanism of this inequality? Okay. And to do that, we recognize that the phenomenon, the post piketty phenomenon of criticizing inequality everywhere, okay, it makes the well-intentioned observer say things like this. Oh, I know why inequality has risen. Inequality has risen because the rich have become richer and the poor have become poorer. Well, fact check. That has certainly happened in the United States, not in China. In China, the rich have become richer and the poor have become richer, just not as quickly. Inequality is a very different animal. 
across different parts of the world, in China and everywhere else. So which leads me to my conclusion. Okay. As scholars here at LSE, as participants in the development forum at LSE, we know that LSE's motto is to understand the causes of things. And we need to get beyond page 15 to understand the causes of inequality here. Okay. Is inequality that we're describing here driven by the inequality that we've seen in post-transition Russia? Russia also had its levels of Gini coefficient move from socialist levels to rampant excess of 48% within the space of 10 years. But the reason that happened in Russia was because there was a grab for natural resources. It is very different from what happened in China. What happened in China is much better described by the Lewis model of development and transition that led to a great movement from between rural and urban areas, a transition from an economy characterized by subsistence agriculture to commercialization, to where China has now reached the so-called Lewis turning point. This Lewis turning point will put in place a set of forces that my prediction will turn around measured levels of inequality. Okay. So as we begin the Q&A part of this session, Kent, I've tried to tell us about how understanding inequality needs to go beyond the kind of breastfeeding that we see so much of the world has participated in a mass hysteria, a mass post piketty hysteria that has grabbed the world. Mm -hmm. And we need to be thinking hard about the nature of inequality that is different across the world, facts that are uncovered by Arthur, and we need to think about the economic mechanisms, the Lewis model, the transition, the Lewis turning point, rural urban mechanics that are now happening in China. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, this, this is a great duet. Uh, I really prefer this than uh, Xu Chenggang's solo. Therefore, um, let's start our, our, our you know, floor discussion and uh, uh, questions and answers. Before we do that, uh, let's say that uh, I confess I only uh, read about 20 pages of a Piketty <laughs> From the back, you know, I only check. <laughs> I only read his index. I'm, you know, I'm as bad as anybody else. But this is a new sort of a das Kapital uh, to condemn the super wealth, the super wealthy, the filthy wealthy. So now the floor is open. Um, any questions, please? Yes. Okay. Can, we can uh, be achieved to, uh, it's like useful to, uh, we, we think is uh, how to achieve by the movement to achieve equality because equality could not exist in the real world. And my question is like, um, for me, I think there are two problems in China. One is economic growth. It's like to uh, increase the lowest bar of the economy. And another thing is to decrease the, uh, equality between the China, between the lowest bar and highest bar. So uh, there are uh, similar thing between these two concepts and there are conflicts between these two concepts. Could you help me to introduce the conflict between the two concepts and how to solve, how people were thinking solve these two conflicts? Okay, so we hold you and is there any other question? Yes, we take three questions and then we ask the panel to respond. Thank you. Could you, uh, Professor Deng Kua and, and Hussein, could you mention each one inefficiency or challenge for efficiency in managing this uh, Lewis transformation that, you, that uh, Professor Kua mentioned? Okay, one more, please. Yes. The front, yes. Just wanted to ask: To what extent does this transformation also result in like extractive effects on the rest of the world, like Africa or Latin America, in the pattern that the West has been setting for the past centuries? Thank you. Okay, thank you. We've got three questions. Um, who wants to speak first, Arthur or, or Danny? Yeah. First, I, I think concepts, that you know. in in, lit in an analyzing inequality always one has to guard against what you call hypothetical examples 
of saying you increase somebody's income and you hold that income and because it the results or answers crucially depend on uh, you know the way you frame the question a question I would like to ask instead of just asking hypothetical question one should imagine whether that can happen in the real world in the real world I mean what conditions would be needed for that to take place so there is so far I know in an actual economy there is no mechanism where you can just selectively raise you know, make sure that all the fruits of economic growth go to certain sections of the population and not to others. By and large, that mechanism is not uh, is difficult to conceive. So my answer would be to the, that question would be I need a bit more, a bit more detail before I can actually give an answer. Because at the general level, you, you pose a question of trade-off. It can go either way. Um, the second question is inefficiency. Well, to provide an example of inefficiency, well, the classic example of there is no trade off between inefficiency and equality. If you take where laborers are working almost at a starvation level, this is the, in economics you say that. Uh, that at very low level of poverty, where people are not getting enough to eat, giving them higher wages reduces inequality but also increases efficiency. So basically, author says uh, they can go both ways. Yeah. You increase your efficiency plus uh, your inequality. It's, it's a twin uh, a situation. It goes under the name of efficiency wage hypothesis, which is certainly for developing countries in certain cases is certainly applicable. Yeah. Okay. Economics will call it a Lawrence curve, right? Uh, you, you can get only you know, worse before you get, get better, yeah. Okay, done. Okay. <coughs> okay, j just on the three questions generally, the, the question about extractive effects on the rest of the world. Um, this is not a question that's specifically about inequality. It's a question about China's foreign economic policy, if I understand the question. It's about how, uh, you know, when China is engaged in collaborations or, you know, uh, in, in economic exchange with the rest of the world, including in Africa, has that led to uh, the kind of win-win outcomes that we've heard Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping and every other Chinese president talk about when they talk about going outside uh, China? And I think that the, you know, to, to step away from what the, the statements have been, and what the intentions have been, to think about what the actual outcomes show. The, um, the evidence goes in, in different directions. There are people at the World Bank and elsewhere who have reported that those African countries that have seen greatest engagement with uh, China's investors, even China's private investors, also the ones that have seen the greatest improvement in governance <coughs> indicators, also the ones that have seen the greatest reduction in measures of corruption. Not to say that that's what the intention of these Chinese companies were, that's simply an outcome along the way of what's happened. Now, again, this doesn't really have, uh, isn't really central to inequality, but I suppose the idea here is that if it is the, a certain kind of, uh, of large businesses that are the ones that go outside China to do engage in business with the rest of the world, including in Africa, what is the outcome of that? Now, all of that, moreover, is also changing because the way the narrative for China's engagement with the rest of the world has proceeded, it now takes the form of either a one-belt, one-road construction, which is how most of the engagement will now take place, or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank dealings. Both of these are expressly designed to improve on governance, to engage in genuine multilateral collaboration and cooperation. So if there are good things that have already happened, then you know, the, the hope is, and certainly the plan is, that that will continue. In terms of challenges of inefficiency or trying to bring about greater egalitarianism, Part of my message is that we don't necessarily, we, are, we're not, we, we have to be clear that those who argue about inequality should not be arguing simply that the world would be better off if we had lower inequality. Okay. 
That is one of a number of things people would like to have happen. I don't want people beating up other people. I don't think that's a good thing. That's something that we can all agree on. But I need to understand the circumstances under which that happens. You know, perhaps these people are beating up this one other person because this one other person has threatened violence against everybody else. We need to understand the circumstances. So too, if we think about inequality, we cannot go into the discussion or debate about inequality with only the idea that inequality needs to be reduced. We need to think about the mechanism that's brought it about and what it's actually affecting. The traditional economic story about inequality, to come to your question, is that you know, one way in which societies that observe high inequality try to repair that is through progressive taxation. Okay. Impose a higher tax rate on those who earn higher incomes and try and help those who are at the lower end of the income spectrum. What we know from social science, from social policy, is that that kind of a system has a tendency to distort incentives. Mm. At the margin, it prevents those who are entrepreneurial, who want to seek higher income from fully engaging with opportunities that are afforded to them at the margin. And so that would be a first, uh, a first way in which we would try and identify a trade-off. Okay. Inequality, extremely high levels of inequality, I think most people would argue are not helpful in society if it leads to social unrest, if it leads to uh, disruption in the fabric of society. Here, at least, we can all agree social unrest is not a good thing. So if inequality is one of the causes of that, then we should try and engage in actions to try and minimize that. However, if inequality has been brought about because it is the natural workings of entrepreneurial people who want to try and advance themselves, Jack Ma might not have pushed mm. on Alibaba as strongly as he had if he had thought that, well, you know, after I make a certain level of income, it all get taken away. Moreover, there's the natural workings of many real world systems where people at that very high level of incomes then give back to society. Many of the world's greatest universities, the University of Chicago would not exist if it weren't for the fact that in American industry, American industry produced the giants of inequality that it did. Bill Gates would not be going around the world trying to cure it of malaria, tuberculosis, and all the ills of, of, uh, of, of society if he didn't, if he didn't make, a, if he didn't have as much money as he did. Very good. So basically, let's say you know, uh, inequality, uh, efficiency are not uh, cost-free or value-free. More questions, please. One, two. We we'll take this too fast and see any more. The two, two. And three. Okay. Uh, so uh, two on this uh, side and one. From, from here. So we take three questions uh, in one go and then uh, we discuss. Please. Thank uh, my you. question is according to the global economic environment and the increased unemployment rate in the China, will it be too difficult for the China to take the transformation at this stage? And if you think we should take the transformation immediately, and how long do you think it will be complete, and what kind of challenge will we miss, will we face in this transformation? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's move on. Uh, second. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, gentlemen, yes, please. Hi, uh, I'm doing, I will see 100, doing a module in quality and poverty. And we read some data about inequality across different countries. So it occurs to me that during the China's growth, inequality goes up and poverty goes down. But in Brazil, inequality goes down and poverty goes down. In Germany, after World War II, inequality goes down and poverty goes down. So I just wonder if there's any specific cultural, institutional reason why you have different trends in different countries. Okay. That's you. great. Move on. One more. Um, yes, that, that hand. Yes, we take three. Hello. I was wondering to what extent you reckon if China always had flat income tax rate, uh, it would develop as fast as it did, and uh, again, what, what flat, rates, flat rate versus um, progressive tax rate? It's basically that question uh, in um, China's perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right, um, Arthur. Right. Le le since it's, le let me first take the last question on tax rate. May 
Uh, uh, some of our co co colleagues have done quite a lot of work on inequality but also on taxation. The general conclusion is that if we are analyzing the effects of taxes or recommending certain types of taxes, we should not only take into account what the, how the tax is designed, but also how it is spent. The result we have come across is that direct government expenditure has far greater impact on welfare of households than ta taxation. So I think a uh, question would be, when you say flat rate tax, the, uh, and the uh, follow-on question should be, what, how does the government spend money on? So it might seem unfair, but if, for example, government expenditure mostly goes on to on social welfare or, or, or on poorer families, then it might actually, conclusions would be very different. Turning question of transformation in China under the present global environment. Well, uh, f first question is what transformation are we talking about? By and large, I would say that to correct inequality in China can be done, uh, it depends crucially on government policies. And I think China has done quite a lot, so, and the more is possible. So I'm, I'm not sure uh, the direct impact of global environment on transformation of China into a more egalitarian society. I mean, if we can go through the details, we can think of uh, the measures which the government can adopt and is already, in some cases, already adopting. Um, so I think that's okay. all. Think. Okay, thank you. Can I just be clear, the, the question about the global economic environment, um, you know, the, 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 it's a very interesting, very relevant question right now. Are there specific aspects that have to do with inequality that you are particularly concerned about, or is it just gen China's general structural transformation? Just, just very quickly, just so I know how to answer, address you all. I'm just wondering if the global economy environment is bad for the China economy. As the un unemployment rate increased, will okay. this affect the inequality in the future during the trans transformation? Or okay, not? all right, okay. Okay. Um, the concerns now, I mean, the, the concerns are, of course, two-way. Because most, you know, well, well, it's right to say that in the global economic environment, China needs to be clear about how its own plans for transformation should go. A lot of the world also looks to China to drive the global economy. Part of the reason that, that many observers say the world, is, world economy is in trouble is because they say China's economy is undergoing this dangerous period of slowdown. And so they're then worrying, you know, is, is this the right time to be, going, to be moving from your industry-directed, export-oriented model of economic growth mm. to one that relies on domestic consumption, trying to move into, you know, higher value-added uh, activities rather than doing what you do best, which is put iPads and iPhones together and send them to the rest of the world. You know, what's the right model of industrial transformation? Mm. Um, that, as you correctly say, that goes hand in hand with the, the, what I think the true structural model of China's inequality ought to be, which is the rural-urban transformation. A lot of what's driven China's manufacturing prowess has been exactly this use of uh, labor from relatively subsistence-level agriculture into somewhat higher-value-added industrial jobs that then... Um, then have driven China's industrial capacity. I suppose the answer to that question is, you know, that in a sense there's no good time to undertake reforms. You know, usually when, when the economy is in crisis, that's when the IMF comes around and says, oh, here's when you need to undertake your structural reforms. Here's when you need to make your economy more efficient. If we take that perspective, then the fact that the global economy is in slowdown and China is no longer able to export as much to the rest of the world as it used to in the past because that source of export demand has dried up, then this is the right time for China to be undertaking its reforms. This is exactly when it should be doing this. I guess the flip side of that is that China is not a small open economy. It is a very large open economy, and what happens in it affects the rest of the world. So there's a delicate balancing act to take forwards here. One might also take, turn your question around and ask the United States, with the global economy in the desperate, critical situation that it is, is this the right time to be raising interest rates? 
<laughs> drawing in, thank you, drawing in, you know, foreign exchange from the rest of the world destabilizing emerging economies. Why? Because the remit of the Federal Reserve System is to take care of its own people, take care of its own economy, not worry about the rest of the world. The world needs greater, you know, better leadership in a joined up thinking way. And that problem, while a lot of it does have to do with how China manages e its economy, is not unique to China. It's not exclusive to China. The re the, all the world has to, to, join ha to join up on this. And I think that it is by ensuring a stable, prosperous economic environment that will do the best things for advancing people's well-being. This is the right time to be undertaking those reforms. And if those reforms end up temporarily disadvantaging some groups, then we're just going to have to go through it. But this is the right time to be undertaking those reforms. The LSD 100 question is, a, is an excellent one. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Well uh, done. <laughs> well done. In fact, I think I might have helped put together some of those data. So I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I fully agree that there are huge differences, heterogeneities, yeah. in how the world has managed yes. poverty reduction, inequality dynamics, and economic growth. I am averse, however, to trying to describe this as a cultural thing, that there's some kind of culture that makes it impossible for people to have different inequality, poverty reduction experiences. Uh, what's happened, I think, the, the great regularity, thanks to you know, people like World Bank economists like David Dollar and Art Cray and others, is that economic growth, regardless of what happens to inequality, economic growth, strong economic growth, is one of the most important factors in lowering poverty. And in some economies, the structures are built such that when economic growth happens, inequality rises. In some others, inequality falls. But either way, it is economic growth that drives poverty reduction. And I think it is that that we do need to focus on, which then you know, makes even more important our understanding how we push forward in this trajectory, in this unstable global economy. Uh, the question about China's tax rates and how alternative policies might have, might have resulted in a different trajectory for China's economy. I think you know, China did amazing things. The, the kind of growth that it has gone through in the last 35 years, uh, something very profound. It came from driving productivity differences across rural, urban areas. It came from a, a migration. It came from transformation of productive capacity. And I suppose, although I don't disbelieve the, the work that's been done on fine-tuning tax transfer government spending schemes, my guess is it is those transformations that have been hugely important for, for managing the poverty reduction and, and income growth that we have seen. And the other things are probably not such high order of magnitude significance. That's not to say that they won't be important going forwards, but if we're using this as a way to think about what's happened in the last 35 years, it is economic growth that has driven the great brunt, that has driven the great force of poverty reduction. Very good. Um, one more round. Uh, yeah, I really like this side of uh, the audience to take, take part in more because you know, you're very quiet. So two, right? One, two, one more. Three, okay, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, it's your show, your glory. Okay, go ahead first. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. My question is, so I just brought, tap it on my phone. Um, the, the changes in national equality were related to much more closely to the economic reforms than the level of income. But the rise was consistent with the upward sloping part of hypothesis Kuznets curve um, um, relating inequality to income level. So can we say that China will be, predict, be predicted to follow the downward sloping part of the, the curve as well in the future, given the fact that the officials in pursuit of economic growth and their lack of accountability generated rent seeking? corruption and procedure injustice, all of which contributed to the growth of localized and national income equality. Is China still a very ideal model for the developmental state to follow uh, economically-wise? Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you are not citing your, your lecture notes. <laughs> God. <laughs> okay, move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to 
Thank you. Uh, I'm a student in international political economy at LSE. Uh, so my question is about the implications of globalization on inequality. China has benefited enorm enormously from integrating into global economy, but in our current area of globalization, uh, there is a restructuring of the global value chain driven by a new round of technological change. So some scholars believe that uh, the transition in the way of production will breed global inequality. And so I want to ask her about your opinion on uh, whether globalization itself is a cause for inequality and whether, uh, so how developing countries in, such as China can seize the opportunity of globalization in reducing its inequality. And my second, a very quick question is in terms of the normative sense of inequality. I really appreciate um, Professor Danny Kwa's question on how much, is the in, uh, how much is the inequality the horror we think it is. So uh, professor, uh, philosophers such as Friedrich, ne uh, Friedrich Nietzsche think that inequality, um, the weak, the existence of the weak and the strong empowers human progress, mm -hmm. but utilitarians such as Mill think that uh, beliefs in the equality in, co in consequence, and also some other scholars believe in the equality and opportunities. So one, I want to ask your opinion, uh, your opinion on the normative sense of inequality, whether it is necessary or whether uh, it should be eliminated. Yeah, that's all, thank you. Okay, wonderful, one more, one more from your side of, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That gentleman, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I have a simpler question compared to what she just asked. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to ask, uh, Professor Kui, earlier in your talk, you mentioned how the, um, the way inequality works is different, for example, in China and in the U.S. Well, in the U.S., the rich get richer and the poor get poor, and in China it's different. I'm wondering how much is that cultural or because of the economic structure? of the two systems, or is it just at the economic level as China is sort of more developing and okay. America is developed? Okay. In the future, once China has become developed, will its inequality be the same way as America's, or will it be different? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very good, very high quality questions, and very long, too. Okay, I, I will turn. <laughs> yeah. Yes, oh, yeah, uh, yes, okay. Danny, uh, invite you uh, at the back to uh, have another question. Yes, go ahead. Yes, it's you, yes, yeah. I'm a student of social economic development, and I have two questions. Can you please explain to me how to do this? Can you please explain to me how to do You are a master student in which discipline? Okay. And my first question is about, um, because some people recommend uh, having decentralization or devolution policy in solving inequality problems. So I wonder what do you think about it in the context of China? And the second question is about the middle income trap. Like, do you think China is experiencing middle income trap? And what do you think is the uh, biggest challenge for China to make it into the uh, high income countries club? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Now, um, Arthur. Right, there are lo lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> but we like challenges. Don't worry about it. Yeah, we like challenges. Yeah, l let me first take a question about Kuznetska. Is, uh, that, uh, there, it, w it was a very appealing hypothesis put forward by Simon Kuznets. Some work which has been done seems to suggest that you cannot claim some kind of scientific regularity for it. And, and it, the results you get qu quite crucially depend on which measure of inequality you use. This has been done for a cross-section of countries. But I think that there is a, an element uh, 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 from very simple model and some element which is worth paying attention to the Kuznets curve, but I would Myself, I would be reluctant to ask question, which part of the Kuznets curve is China presently on? Mm. Because we have no way of actually locating Chinese position that Kuznets curve, assuming that exists. And turn to question about globalization. Yeah. I think there's no doubt that globalization can both 
reduce inequality and also increase inequality. There is absolutely nothing. I mean, both parties can actually gain from globalization, that's fair. But one party can gain much more than the other. I mean, that's also p perfectly possible. So in general, I would say that globalization, important issue is that globalization has definitely helped to further economic growth. That is, the type of economic growth we see now since the last 20 or 30 years were completely incredible in, in, in historically. I mean, economies just do not grow at 10 percent a year. For, for example, catching up is much easier in a globalized economy than non-globalized economy. So this is not a defense of globalization or the acceptance by saying that, yes, in some cases, countries can be made worse off, and also certain sections of the population can be made worse off. So again, you have to say, what, what is the best attitude to that? One is to not to trade or go anti-globalization measure. Other alternative is to say, what, how we can compensate people or sections of population who are adversely affected. Mm. So that's, and Danny has been doing research on the middle income trap. And because I've got only one thing to say, well, that is, to my eyes, a country which grows about 7% a year cannot be in a trap. And if there is a car, <laughs> yeah. I think if it's a trap, we completely transform the meaning of a trap. <laughs> it's a dynamic trap. <laughs> God. Okay, very good. The, you know, as, as Arthur said, there are a lot of questions here. Let me try and answer them in a group of, in, in, a group, in three groups. The first group has to do with the, the difference between the United States and China, how the inequality there is different, and the consistency of what we see in China with the so-called Kuznets curve. You know, remember, as Arthur has pointed out, the Kuznets curve was meant to be the idea that if you, if you graph on the horizontal axis levels of development, and you graph on the vertical axis inequality, then there's an inverted U-shape to that, which is that low levels of development inequality is low, and high levels of development inequality is also low, but to get through from one end to the other, you have to go, go through a stage where there's a high level of inequality. Now, as, as Arthur has also very appropriately pointed out, the empirical evidence on this is actually not very strong. Yes, Simon Kuznets is one of the great empiricist of the economics profession from 60 years ago. And, you know, he was the one who, I mean, he was practically an economic historian. He was very yes. careful with data. And so when he said something was true in the numbers, you, you believed him. But the latest empirical statistical evidence suggests that, you know, the Kuznets curve, if it's, if it's actually there, is very flimsy. It's mm. not sturdy. Nonetheless, I want to try and make the case that Kuznets was actually right and that Kuznets does help explain both the difference between the United States and China and a prediction for what, where China will go. Kuznets' story was, yes, it did begin with just some numbers, but he was a good economic historian. He didn't just remain at those numbers. He said, I have an idea about why this happens. And in fact, he was so creative, he came up with five ideas about why this happened. But one of his ideas was, this is about the transition between rural economies, rural-based economies, and urban-based ones. And he said, here's my story. At the low levels of development, with low levels of inequality, what happens is everybody's, I mean, inequality is low because everybody is poor, right? With everybody poor, with pretty much everyone just scratching the earth to barely get by, not much room for the top 1% to make off with the wealth of society. Everyone is just poor. At very high levels of, of development, maybe for policy reasons or otherwise, societies find it valuable to try and bring inequality low again. But in the middle, what happens? And here's Kuznets' story. He said, in the middle, you know what happens is, inequality is high because some people start leaving the rural areas to go work in the urban areas. And inequality starts to rise because you've got a few of these people making the move. And the inequality that you measure is the inequality between the great majority of people left in the agricultural rural areas and the few and building who are starting to move to higher value added manufacturing in industry. And as more and more of them leave, inequality 
mechanically, simply arithmetically mm. rises mm. because you've got this urban-rural transition going on. Now, you can read China's history of inequality and say, yes, that is the rising part of the Kuznets curve, not for any devious reasons like there are extractive elites out there drawing wealth away from everyone else. No, it's just the mechanical Kuznets curve working its way through the system rural urban transition. And if that's the right story, that also says, as was conjectured by the question, eventually you have everybody pretty much involved in high value added activity, whether it's in the urban area or in very mechanized, very productive rural areas. And then inequality is low again. If that's the mechanics of what happens, there's no deep political economy, there's no evil extractive elites, there's no class struggle going on. It is just arithmetic. And it is arithmetic that's driving the Kuznets curve. And I think, although the story is very simple, well, actually, because the story is very simple, sometimes people don't like it. It's not got sort of, there's no dynamic game with strategic complementarities and people with hidden information and you can't write a good economics research paper publish it in a five-star journal from that. <laughs> it's see. a simple story. But you know what? It's probably right. So I am quite optimistic that we will see something like that happen. Mm. Globalization and rising up the value chain is the second group and let me just be so uh, the huge set of issues, Arthur has referred to that. Let me just talk about the the robotics mechanization. What, do we, what does it look like going forward from here? Anne-Marie Slaughter, president of the New America Foundation, wrote the article in the Atlantic Monthly about why women still can't have it all. Mm -hmm. She's writing a book now about restructuring the workplace so that women can be more fully participative, that we no longer have the kind of sexist society that after five decades of, of, of reforms we are still stuck with because of certain biological imperatives. She pointed out something that I think many of us have observed, that as the world mechanizes, as we move up the value chain, as robotics and digital technologies, information technologies become more important, you know what? The things that will become more valuable are the things that currently are not very well paid. Surgeons, accountants, good gosh, even investment bankers, all of them will be mechanized away. If you're going to be running a spreadsheet, I want a robot running the spreadsheet. I don't want somebody forgetting to press update on the spreadsheet. I want it mechanized. If you're going to be doing surgery, I want a robot to be doing that surgeon. I don't want surgery. I don't want to be a, a tired person who's quarreled with her husband. She's come in. She's mm. crabby. She's in a bad mood operating on me. I want a robot. All high value, even professors, my goodness. Professors will be replaced. <laughs> professors are not very well paid, but even they... <laughs> true, that, that is true. Absolutely. Even they will be replaced by robots. I think it, it is flashing. Okay. As they are replaced by robots, it will be gardeners, it will be carers, it will be healthcare workers, people who have the human touch, who are currently not well paid they will rise up the value chain, they will get paid more, and inequality will fall. If I can have 30 seconds on the middle income trap. Go ahead. There are only, <laughs> there are only five countries that have successfully escaped the middle income trap. They are, okay, five economies. They are Taiwan, Korea, Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Yeah. Okay. What is their common characteristic? They're all Asian. They're all East Asian. They're all Confucian tradition. They all started out as unbalanced economies, heavily concentrated in manufacturing and industry. They were all export-oriented, and they were all criticized by Western economists for being an unbalanced economy. They've all made the transition to high-value-added manufacturing. They've all become first-world countries. I'm very optimistic that China will be able to say, undergo the same trajectory, because if there's one thing all of these countries have in common, they all look like China. Thank you so very much. So uh, two points that we can take home with, uh, especially for uh, LSC students. One is uh, equality and efficiency are not zero sum. And secondly, we have a great deal of positivism, which is the foundation of our LSE study. Thanks, thank you so very much.
Thank you for the very in-depth discussion session. And uh, if you choose the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank Panel AIIB, please be back here in 10 minutes. If you choose the One Bell One Road, please proceed to the Wolfson Theatre, which is next door. Thank you. Yes.